Makoto Katoa. Welcome to today's talk about aerial photographs at Auckland Council Archives. My name, as Shona said, is Owen Gordon, and I'm one of the archivists at the central office downstairs in the basement of the library. Just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and thank James Armstrong, who is the team leader of archives, and he put together much of the material that I'll be using today. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here. So aerial photographs are one of the few items in local government archives that immediately impress visitors and customers. If anyone comes into the reading room downstairs, one of the very first things they notice is this very large photograph of the borough of Mount Roskill, taken in 1988. And here we've got a picture of Keith Stewart, who is the senior archivist for South Archives. And I've included Keith here uh, for two reasons. One, he, it gives you an idea of just how big the photograph is. Um, Keith isn't that big himself. And secondly, I've noticed that whenever Keith comes into the reading room, he very often looks at the aerial photographs and him, he gets up really close to them and points out uh, features like places he grew up, schools he went to, places he might have worked, and sometimes like picture houses that he might have gone to. I think this way of looking at aerial photos is something people tend to do quite instinctively. And because they're usually very precisely dated, it's very easy for people then to think back to maybe what was going on in their lives at the time or imagine the lives of other family members. And I think it's this very um, human reaction and, and sense of connection to the images that's one reason these photos are so special. It's quite a different experience um, looking at a map or a plan. Maps show an area as they're measured by surveyors for a, a specific purpose. And plans or drawings of buildings are, are very often a record of um, future proposals by architects or planners. Generally, maps won't show the same high level of detail that aerial photographs do, or have features like cars, washing lines, or maybe veggie gardens, uh, features that reflect people's daily lives and interests. <laughs> aerial photographs can also show features and relationships that aren't visible from the ground, allowing the viewer to see far more that can be seen with the naked eye, or in most cases from any other vantage point. So this is just a little outline of what we're going to be looking at today. We've got a very brief history, an explanation of aerial photography, um, a little bit about local authorities, um, some of the uses of aerial photography, and the main sources of aerial photographs in New Zealand. And finally, we'll take a little look at what archives have in terms of their holdings. So our first section, a brief history and explanation of aerial photography. The very first aerials were taken as long ago as 1858 in France by a photographer in a balloon. Um, it soon became very evident that basically anything that could go up in the air could be used for taking aerials. So as well as balloons, we ended up having cameras attached to kites, rockets, or as we can see here, pigeons. Um, if you've ever seen some of the pictures taken by the pigeons, they're quite wonky. Uh, they really are. Um, during the First World War in Europe, there was significant military use of aerial photography for reconnaissance. And indeed, they did some battlefield experiments using pigeons, and that didn't really come to very much. Back in New Zealand, the very first aerial photographs uh, taken from an aeroplane were probably taken in 1917, by an instructor at the New Zealand Flying School. I say probably because I've, I've heard several names credited with taking the first photograph and a few different years as well. If anyone knows um, for definite what that is, I'd be really interested to know. So there are two types of aerial photographs held in local authority archives. Vertical, where the photograph's taken from directly overhead, or oblique. Um, Oblique aerials fall into two types. High obliques are almost like ground photographs taken from a very high vantage point and show the horizon. This makes them particularly good for pictorial or illustrative purposes, where the aim is to capture a very wide sweeping view of an area. Uh, low, oblique, low obliques don't include the horizon, 
So this is an example of an oblique aerial photograph of Mount Eden Domain from the archives collection. Um, it also reminds us that Auckland has a very unique landscape and that before aerial photographs, uh, photographers like Boscowen were using uh, Auckland's volcanic cones as vantage points to see large distances. Um, this particular photograph also illustrates one of the drawbacks of oblique aerials. Um, obviously having such a large mound at the front means that you lose quite a lot of detail from behind the mountain so that you wouldn't be able to use these for mapping purposes. Oblique aerial photographs are particularly good for giving a general impression of the development of an area. Um, for example, these next couple of slides are from a book kept by Ellerslie Borough Council, which was explicitly titled Borough of Ellerslie, a visual administrative record of progress. And these were used to show post-war changes to the Ellerslie area. And this book is in archive series ELB 004. And um, this is uh, the first, the earliest picture taken from that book. It's in 1946. And uh, it gives you an idea of how sparsely uh, developed Ellerslie was compared with the much later 1987, where you can, it's very clear to see the amount of development that's just gone on. Today we'll focus mostly on vertical overhead aerial photography because they're much more useful for survey and mapping purposes. <laughs> Mosaic aerial photographs are based on individual vertical aerial photographs combined so that they appear to be one large aerial photograph. Looking at areas of water can help in their identification since the different photographs capture the light and light changes across the water between exposures. Uh, some mosaics must have been re-photographed and this is likely to cause loss of detail in the mosaic compared to the photographs on which they're based. The, the very large mosaic of Mount Roskill Borough that we saw earlier used separate trimmed photographs and you can actually feel the joins between them. And it's very easy here in this example to see where they've been spliced together. Suitable weather for flying for aerial photography is very limited in Auckland, April and September being the best months. And in some years, there are only eight or nine days of the year that might be, actually be suitable. Uh, for this reason, photographs in some surveys for local authorities were taken on different days, sometimes several months apart. Uh, the 1968 survey, which is series ACC 052 in the archives collection is an example of this. Perfect weather conditions for aerial photography were when there was full sun, no cloud, and unsurprisingly little wind. Air pollution could also affect the clarity of, of aerial photographs. So apparently having some moisture in the air was quite helpful as it dampened down dust particles. Uh, this diagram demonstrates the photographic coverage along a flight line. You can see up in the top, top part of the diagram, there's roughly a 50% overlap here. So each area will actually end up being photographed twice. For survey purposes, the overlap was even greater, around 60%. Uh, because this overlap area was photographed twice from slightly different angles, if the two photographs were then viewed through a stereoscope, it would create a three-dimensional effect. And this means that the perspective views captured in each individual photograph could be transformed into plan views, which were suitable for mapping purposes. The bottom part of the diagram again shows the overlap area, the shaded area here, um, but also how the, the aircraft's drift this wavy line, how that causes the edges to be out of alignment. Um, this drift will be accounted for on the plane's return flight, when again, there'll be an over overlap of between 15 and 25%. The type of plane was also a factor in how good the resulting photographs were going to be. It was much easier to maintain altitude and reduce the amount of drift with twin engine rather than single air engine airplanes. Um, just a very short word about scale. Uh, photograph scale is the relationship between 
a distance on the photograph and the corresponding distance on the ground. And it's often shown as a ratio. For example, a photo scale of one to 10,000 means that one millimeter on the photo would represent 10,000 millimeters or 10 meters on the ground. The scale of aerial photographs is usually established by comparisons of fixed points on the ground and by using existing survey maps. And an even shorter note about cameras, American Fairchild and German Zeiss cameras seem to be the most popular kinds used for aerial photography companies in New Zealand. These cameras were able to produce large negatives, so larger prints could be made without losing quality. And uh, this is just an example of a, a print from the Mount Eden borough. Um, aerial, aerial photographs were often reproduced using dye line methods or other plan reproduction techniques. Half-tone transpar transparencies, which are positive photographic images on transparent film, were introduced to New Zealand in 1965. 1965 was also the year that colour aerial photography began in New Zealand. That was for the New Zealand Forest Service. Uh, there are very few holdings of vertical colour aerial photographs in Auckland Council archives, although there are a few water care aerials of Pukatutu Island, I believe, from the, uh, the early 2000s. We'll move on now to look at local authorities and aerial photography. In this section, we'll take a look at three of the earliest local authority surveys done in New Zealand, starting with the 1926 survey of Christchurch, and then two surveys of Auckland in 1940, and one starting in the late 1950s. After this, from around the mid 1960s, aerial surveys became rather more common and local authorities in Auckland began to commission them for specific purposes, as we'll see later. Nineteen twenty-six, and Christchurch was the first city council in New Zealand to commission aerial photographs for town planning. The project was proposed by Christchurch's city engineer, who argued it would be considerably cheaper than doing ordinary survey work using instruments on the ground. <coughs> He also thought it was important for the city planning department to have aerials that the people of Christchurch could view that didn't require any particular skills to interpret. In this sense, I think he considered them to be quite a valuable PR tool in, in addition to the uses that the staff would be making of them. The survey was carried out by the New Zealand Permanent Air Force following an agreement between Council and Crown, so the, the photographs were Crown, Crown copyright. And Christchurch City Council already had a ground plan of the city that was used by the aerial surveyors. The survey produced 14 mosaic sheets, each two feet square. If we take a closer look at the mosaic sheet shown in the slide, uh, we can see that weather conditions were not perfect for the survey. Uh, up in the top corner here, you can see um, quite long shadows cast by trees and some very obvious joins between the aerial photographs on which the mosaic was based. Uh, we jump forward quite a few years to 1940 and the first aerial photographs of the Auckland Isthmus taken for a local authority. Uh, Auckland City Council minutes show that this wasn't in fact a council initiative. It was proposed by the managing director of New Zealand Aerial Mapping Limited, who offered to survey map and supply prints of the Auckland region in connection with work the company was already doing for the New Zealand military. Council was mostly interested in two areas, the 79 square miles of the Auckland Isthmus and the block of one 137 square miles west of the Isthmus across to the west coast, running from south to north up from the Manukau Harbour as far north as a line across Browns Island. The total cost of the survey was going to be 818 pounds, but because central government needed the photographs taken for defense purposes, they, they actually contributed a third of that cost, bringing the cost to council down to the grand sum of 550 pounds. <clears throat> 
Some of this cost was taken from the accounts of the waterworks and the parks and reserves departments, as they had particular interests in the Western Bloc. The 1940 survey produced almost 170 small aerial photographs, each one measuring about nine by six inches at a scale of roughly one to 11,000. From these, eight large mosaics of Auckland and environs at a scale of 528 feet to the inch were produced from this survey. And this is the index sheet for the 1940 survey showing an alphanumeric grid superimposed onto a map of the central Auckland area. These index sheets act as very useful finding aids when it comes to retrieving photographs at a later date. And they're much easier to understand and interpret than the flight line diagrams that we saw earlier. Uh, probably the only drawback to these is that often they're not 100% accurate at showing boundaries. We move on now to the much bigger aerial survey, which was almost 20 years later. This was the Auckland Regional Planning Authority Aerial Survey of Auckland. It was the project between 1957 and 1960. <clears throat> Just a little bit of background here. The Auckland Regional Planning Authority was formed in 1954 in compliance with the provisions of the Town and Country Planning Act of the previous year, 1953 they were succeeded by the Auckland Regional Authority in 1963. After the 1940 survey, Auckland City Council wasn't particularly enthusiastic about commissioning aerial photography for two main reasons. The first, it was very expensive. And the second reason was the rate of post-war urban development meant that photographs very quickly became out of date. In 1945, White's Aviation Limited had offered to take new aerial photographs, but the city engineer argued that the council had already spent considerable sums on aerials and they would just have to make do with what they had for the time being. White's were a little more successful when their representative approached Onihunga Borough Council two years later in 1947. And even then, but only then, but even then, <laughs> they only took five oblique aerials of the whole borough, and that was considered sufficient. So in 1957, the Regional Planning Authority observed that Auckland City was really falling behind other centres in New Zealand. And this was because there were so many local authorities involved in the Auckland region and there was no coordinated effort to actually ha have the work done. So they proposed a new full aerial survey of the whole of the Auckland region. <laughs> we can read in the Auckland Council minute books what various department heads thought of this proposal, and there really wasn't very much support. The, the city engineer, the deputy town planning officer, and the city valuer held similar views that the photos would soon be out of date, they wouldn't get used very much, and that in general, they just couldn't justify the expenditure. The Auckland Transport Board rejected the proposal for very man many of the same reasons as Auckland City Council staff. <clears throat> However, one person who did see the value of the project was the city librarian. And I'll just read you what he had to say about it. Apart from their display value, Maps of this kind would have little immediate practical value in the library. But isn't this the kind of information which any self-respecting city should be collecting and preserving as part of its archival material? The fact that their value may be fully appreciated only by future generations of historians and research workers is probably a very sound reason for making a start now. The survey, or at least parts of it, would have to be repeated at periodic intervals. And I think that's pretty much what's happened since then. The Director of Works and the City Engineer did eventually recommend that Auckland City Council participate in the project on the understanding that the costs would be shared equitably by all the local authorities participating. Costs were allocated according 
to the mean percentage of capital value, the population and area of each borough or county, Auckland City Council therefore paid the most by a very large margin. They paid almost £2,000 and Henderson Borough the least, a very modest £40. Of the total cost of £11,400, half was charged to 23 territorial local authorities in Greater Auckland and half to four ad hoc local authorities, which included the Auckland Harbour Board. And this is one of the photographs that was produced from that survey. And um, just to give you a little bit of orientation, this is uh, Albert Park up here and Civic Theatre over here. And we're roughly, I can't see where we are in this, roughly here, in this block. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of the amount of detail that was captured in these, this is a, a detail from that photograph, taken much closer, and you can see just how detailed it is. <clears throat> and this is one of the mosaic sheets that was produced from that survey. Many Auckland local authorities ordered enlarged photographs of the survey um, at a scale of 100 feet to the inch, while the mosaic sheets, like the ones shown here, were at 330 feet to the inch. In total, the survey produced 1,350 negatives, so it was really quite a big project. By 1960, when Auckland City Council was preparing contour maps of the Rosebank Road, peninsula in West Auckland, it appears that their earlier opposition to earlier surveys has lessened somewhat. The city engineer concluded an aerial survey would gain council six months in time compared to a ground survey. Although an aerial survey would be over 10% more expensive, it would also free up staff because, quote, to obtain the same data manually would occupy two parties of three men about 10 months of fine days for field work, unquote, as well as involving their transport costs. So clearly now he believed the cost of surveying was justified. By the 1960s, mid 1960s, uh, the decision to commission new aerials for different, sometimes quite specialized purposes came from local authorities in Auckland rather than from the aerial companies looking for work and local authorities began making allowances for their cost in their financial estimates. In 1965, the Auckland Regional Authority proposed that Auckland local authorities commission a new aerial survey of the Auckland metropolitan area. But judging from holdings at Auckland uh, Archives Central Office, nothing actually came of this. However, there was an aerial survey project in 1968, which was flown by Aero Surveys Limited, that included Auckland City, Ellerslie, Mount Eden, Mount Roskill, Otahuhu, One Tree Hill, Devonport, and New Lynn, which produced detailed photographs, mostly scaled at 100 feet to one inch. This slide is part of a photograph taken from the 1968 survey. <coughs> The high degree of detail captured in these photographs was largely due to the longer focal length Zeiss cameras that were introduced to New Zealand from West Germany in 1965. These had a focal length of 24 inches. It was possible now to see the shadows cast by clotheslines. I think you can see them here. And telephone wires, even though the camera would have been several thousand feet above the ground. We'll move on now to look at some of the uses of aerial photography and just give you a second to read through that list a little bit. By 1973, 
Auckland City Council had three main purposes for aerial photography. One, um, high altitude single shot photographs for town planning. Two, individual intersection photographs for traffic engineering. And three, photographs for creating detailed contour plans over a very large area, and that was for drainage design. But as you can see here, there are lots of other uses um, for aerials. They roughly fall into two groups, either what their intended use was when they were originally being commissioned, or what they've been subsequently used for since being transferred to archives. I, I'm not going to go into a, a, a huge amount of detail about all of these, um, but I'll talk about a few which I think are quite interesting. <laughs> um, the next few slides relate to water services. That includes water mains, sewers, hydrants, and valves. Maybe not very exciting, but um, we can see here we have a newspaper article from the Open Star. And this gentleman is Jack Pritchard. And along with two students from the university, um, he spent his summer spray painting 2,000 manholes in preparation for a survey of Mount Wellington Borough, which was flown in 1966. Uh, the, the city engineer of Mount Wellington actually had some 4,000 ground marks painted to record the precise position, precise position of underground services. And so if we move on here to the next slide, we'll see this is one of the sheets um, which was produced and it's been annotated to show where the water services were mm -hmm based on those grant marks. It's a little bit difficult to see. They're up at the, towards the top, but I'll just flick forward. And that's a detail showing how they were able to mark the maps according to the grant marks that they'd made previously. Back to this one. Uh, the scale of this is roughly 40 feet to one inch. Um, there was also an aerial survey of Remuera and Parnell in 1971, which was also part of council preparation for comprehensive drainage proposals, and that's in archive series ACC 036. Just going back to our, our uses here, town planning, this includes uh, resource management consents and mapping for district schemes and district plans. Um, <clears throat> architecture, aerials could be used uh, in the design of new buildings or alterations to existing ones. For example, the aerials we have connected with the Britomark project in the 1990s, and these are an archive series AKC 407. Uh, telecommunications modelling, um, for example, there was a 1985 survey of Great Barrier Island by aerial surveys for the New Zealand Post Office showing underground telephone cables, and that's in archive series GBI 052. Uh, geography and geology, uh, this includes um, using aerials to identify land use. Uh, we've spoken a little bit about mapping already. Um, aerials were originally used for identifying topographic features in unmapped areas, and also for creating contour plans, and they're also used for establishing reliable measurements between objects and image author rectification. That's removing distortions. Uh, traffic engineering. Here's an example again of pre marks on the ground. And this was for a survey um, to do with traffic intersections in Auckland in 1970. And this is series ACC 051. And they photographed about 60 inter intersections. Um, as you can imagine, this created a fair amount of interest from the, the community, judging from this New Zealand Herald piece, which talks about the appearance of mysterious white painted arrowheads on the streets. And the reason, the reason this survey was done was because um, they needed to keep planners maps up to date with changes to the arrangement of Auckland city streets partly because of the entry of the motorway 
um, it became very common practice actually to paint these ground control P marks when preparing for an aerial survey. And this is one of the photographs that resulted from that. And you can see the chevrons here, 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 and here. And back to our uses of aerial photography. Um, in archaeology, they're, they're often used by um, archaeologists, surprisingly, uh, who can use them to identify Maori occupation sites or other types of uh, land use. Um, even in cases where they might be obscured now by, for example, crops. Uh, student projects. Uh, we sometimes get students who come in from the University of Auckland School of Architecture and Planning, um, and they've asked to see aerial photographs. Um, agriculture and forestry. They can help with crop assessment, the detection of crop disease and insects, soil classification, scrub and gorse measurement. Hydrology and hydrography, this would include present and future uses of water, the detection of pollution, uh, shoreline mapping, shore reclamation and beach erosion. Quantity surveying, aerials um, can show things like stockpiles at ports or at open cast mines and quarries. Um, there's also, there are advantages too of doing aerial surveys during census years, as that allows statistics to be compared to actual development on the ground. And we have had a few um, police inquiries where they've wanted to look at aerials and when they're investigating historic crimes. Uh, the last section, the last two, I've kind of lumped together as property and local history. Um, Aerials can be very good at showing changes over time to an area. Um, an example of this type of use was a customer who came into the, our North Archives office once, who was buying a property in the Birkdale area, and they wanted to know where the land had previously been used for farming strawberries. And that was because they were concerned there might still be very high levels of pesticide in the soil. So that's a modern day example of looking back at what previous um, aerials have been able to show. Uh, more recent aerial photographs can also show a, lot of, show a lot of detail of individual properties, including features such as retaining walls, fences and other boundaries, as well as alterations to properties. Um, so the next example, I've kind of taken a property just at random, uh, which is this one. And it's a little uh, average house in Point Chevalier on Moor Road. <clears throat> And I'm just going to go through quite quickly. There's about 10 or 11 slides um, from about 19, from 1940 to 1993. So that's just over 50 years. And uh, show the changes to the area. And um, you can see some of the changes to the property. Um, it's, it's most of the changes to the property. We have other records uh, that we can um, fact check with uh, like building permit plans and applications. But I'll just go through this and show you what's going on. This was originally part of the Liverpool estate, uh, which I'll show you. It's this lot here. And this is the first aerial photograph that we have from 1940. And the section of where our house is, is down here. But you can see that Point Chev is still very much a work in progress. Uh, Moa Road continues up here. It doesn't yet join to Miola Road, which is this one here. And you can see too that Miola Road itself doesn't extend across to Westmere that hadn't been built yet. This is a, a detail, again, showing the development of Walmer Road, Moa Road. And I think this is uh, Deloon, Deloon, this street. Um, the house we're interested in is done here. Um, this is a mosaic from 1958. And a detail from that mosaic. And this is our very little house here. <clears throat> 
1968, you can see there's quite a change in quality and you can actually make out quite a lot more features of our house. This is a 1974 one. This is a slightly different orientation. So I'll just find it's the, actually this property here. This being Great North Road going down towards Western Springs. And this is the property here. I can tell you that there have been significant changes to the house's roof line based on other records that I've got. And also the garage has been extended as well. This is a 1986 aerial of the Point Share from Western Springs areas. It's quite an obvious feature here, which we see now, which, oh, which, right. oh, hmm, okay. Which is, of course, the motorway. And this is our house here, I believe. Um, in 1989, uh, on the amalgamation of local authorities in the Auckland Isthmus, engineers at the new Auckland City Council now faced the problem of aerial surveys inherited from previous local authorities often taken by different companies at different times and different scales. So the 1993 image is from a new aerial survey, uh, which produced about 640 photographs, and it covered the whole of the Auckland Isthmus at a scale of one to 6,000. And these are in archive series AKC 092. This is the same property on the road here. So we move on to a section about the, the main sources of primary of, of aerial photography in New Zealand. Central government was a pioneer of aerial photography, particularly the New Zealand Permanent Air Force, which later was the Royal New Zealand Air Force. More recently, aerial photographs were taken by the Departments of Land and Survey, the New Zealand Forest Service, which I mentioned, the Ministry of Works and Development, and the New Zealand Geological Survey. There were three commercial companies who provided most of the aerial photographs used by local authorities in Auckland, and these were New Zealand Aerial Mapping Limited of Hastings, uh, White's Aviation Limited of Auckland, and Aerial Surveys Limited of Tauranga and Nelson. And I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about each of these in turn. The oldest of the three is New Zealand Aerial Mapping Limited of Hastings, which was established in 1936 by the surveyor, amateur pilot and photographer, Pete Van Ash. He was very fortunate to have had some financial support from prominent landowners in, in Hawke's Bay, who provided some funding for him to travel to England to buy a Monospar ST25 twin engine aircraft and also for his training. On his return to New Zealand, he arranged contracts to photograph their farms. Um, his company grew quite steadily, generally carrying out work for the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, as well as the Public Works Department. In 1938, it began working for the Land and Survey Department, later known as the Department of Land and Survey Information, and now, of course, as Land Information New Zealand LINS. During the Second World War, they became increasingly involved in defence mapping projects and acquired a second aircraft with a greater range. And this enabled them to start surveying further afield. Their first offshore survey in 1944 was the Fiji, and they would go on to photograph most of the Pacific Islands and places as far away as Kathmandu, Vietnam, Thailand and the Antarctic. The company was one of the longest established aerial survey companies in the world, 
eventually establishing a base in the Middle East. Um, they unfortunately became insolvent in 2014. Their library at that point had over 1 million images and it was a significant asset. And this was acquired by Land Information New Zealand and added to the Crown Aerial Film Archive. Uh, this archive is now managed by a company called WSP New Zealand Limited. Um, I believe it was called Opus prior to that. Uh, who started scanning it back in 19, uh, sorry, 2014. Uh, this scanning project is expected to be completed in 2023, but many of the photographs are already available online uh, on the RetroLens website. I'll move on now to the second of our companies, the White Sea Aviation Limited, which I'm sure is very familiar. Uh, this was established in Auckland in 1945, and they specialized in oblique scenic views and produced several editions of a very popular book, White's Pictorial Reference of New Zealand, which was first published in 1952. Um, the company's photographs were in black and white and covered almost every town in New Zealand. Uh, very often they were hand colored for display like the one shown here. And White's actually employed a team of what they called coloring girls at the time, who hand painted the photographs using a length of grapevine um, with the tip wrapped in cotton wool, dipped into very thinned oil paint. So it was a very delicate pro uh, process. Um, in 1988, White's Aviation was bought by Air Logistics New Zealand Limited, which is currently in business as Aerial Surveys Limited. And in 2007, the White's Aviation Archive was acquired by the Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington. Um, the archive comprises around 80,000 negatives and 50,000 prints, and many of these um, can now be seen on the library's website. Uh, the last of our three companies is Aerial Surveys Limited of Nelson and Tauranga, and this has had quite a complex commercial history. It, since it started in 1963 as Aerial Surveys Nelson Limited, it has changed names several times and expanded by acquiring five other aerial photography companies, including Aero, Aero Surveys Limited of Tauranga in 1976, and it adopted its current name in 2007. Um, aerial Surveys has an extensive photograph library that contains images dating back to the 1950s, uh, they have over 300,000 images captured with film-based cameras and more than 300,000 images captured by digital mapping cameras. Um, there's much more information about aerial surveys and the work that they do and their historic aerials library, um, and that's on their website. So we'll move on and, and have a little look at what we have in, in Auckland Council archives. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'll just say that these aren't intended to be fully comprehensive lists, uh, but they do give you an idea of the amount of coverage of a particular borough um, that Archives has. Um, you can see there's uh, some of the smaller boroughs will have less coverage than obviously Auckland City, which we see here. Um, the, the top two we've already seen, the ACC 020 was the 1940 survey, and the Auckland Regional Planning Authority project is in ACC 021 and the mosaics in ACC 054. Um, the, the second part of this down the bottom, you can see how uh, aerial surveys were being commissioned for particular purposes. And this slide shows the first vertical aerial photographs series that are for other local authorities in the Auckland Isthmus. Um, the earliest ones for these six at the top, let me just point at those, um, were again resulting from that Auckland Regional Planning Authority project from 1957 to 1960. Apart from Auckland City Council, holdings of aerial photographs 
by other local authorities in the Auckland Isthmus uh, are quite limited. In the 1980s, the New Zealand Map Society did a survey asking for details of holdings of aerial photographs, including mosaics, and they found that, um, for example, Mar Mount Eden Borough Council had only 80, while Otahu Borough Council had even fewer, they had 68. Um, interestingly, Manukau City Council held only 90, but Takapuna City Council had a rather impressive 850. Oblique aerial photograph holdings for some boroughs typically include a handful of photographs, sometimes hand colored, taken by White's Aviation, and they, these were generally for display in the borough council chambers. Um, this uh, gives you an idea of what uh, we hold in the Archives North collection. And you can see there's quite a few series of, of Takapuna ones, which I mentioned earlier. And we'll move on to what's in West. And finally, just to give you an idea of what's what we have for South. So finally, just, just a quick word about where you can see the aerial photographs that Archives has. Many of our photographs have been digitized and we're gradually adding more. Um, these can be viewed on the Archives website. Just, uh, I've put the address up here, but it's probably easiest if you just Google Auckland Council Archives and uh, you're able to search our database there and have a look at what there is. Unfortunately, our website's actually down for maintenance at the moment. Um, but we hope to have it up again, working as soon as possible. Uh, you can also see um, Auckland archive, uh, archived aerials on the Auckland Council Geomap site, uh, which is just part of the main Auckland website. Um, aerial photographs are just part of this. The photographs from the 1940 survey and the 1959 photographs are there as well as many later series of photographs that aren't actually part of archives collections. These are mostly from the Auckland Regional Council. And of course, you're very welcome to come to our offices and see them. Um, we're actually in two different offices at the moment. We're in the basement of this building and that's Archives Central and we hold the archives for Auckland City and, and its uh, previous legacy consuls. And the other building we're in is across from Bledisloe House, and that's over in Wellesley Street, and they hold the collections for North, South and West. Um, the best thing to do is possibly to email us um, and tell us what you're actually looking for, and we'll be able to tell you if we've got um, something that be, might be of interest to you. Um, our central office is open Monday, uh, 2 to 5 p.m., Monday to Friday, or by appointment. And for our north, south, and west office, um, it's best, again, to email us and make an appointment to come in and view anything there. So that's just about everything I've got um, to talk about uh, aerial photographs at Auckland Council Archives. Um, I, I didn't touch very much on the technical side of, of photography because it's not something that we really concern ourselves a lot with. Um, if you're interested in cameras, uh, aircraft, films, um, and about New uh, aerial photography as a whole in the country, um, there's some really good books here. And th these ones are Pete's Eye in the Sky and No Clouds Today um, are particularly interesting, I think. Uh, 